the daughter of a movie monster, up next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem, I'm Marjorie Chacon. 2018 marks the 200th anniversary of the very first publication of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Here at Montclair State, the Films and Filmmakers series, a Film Institute weekly program about movies, invited Sarah Karloff, daughter of actor Boris Karloff, to talk about the true icon behind several Frankenstein films. Sarah gives us a behind-the-scenes look at how life with her father, a movie monster, truly was. Let's take a look. My father was the youngest of nine children, and his real name was William Henry Pratt. He was British, um, but he felt that Pratt was not a very uh, appropriate name for an actor. So somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, while he was in British Columbia learning his craft, he changed it to Boris Karloff. He often t uh, said that in interviews when he was asked where the name came from, he said that Karloff came somewhere uh, way back in his mother's side of the family and that Boris simply came from thin air. Who knows? Um, he was educated. He was the youngest of nine children. Uh, he had seven brothers and one sister. He was educated uh, formally for the diplomatic service in uh, England, and most of his brothers served in the diplomatic service in China or in India. And after his formal education, he decided it was that certainly was not the career he wanted. He was wanted to become an actor, which immediately made him the black sheep of the family. He uh, flipped a coin. Uh, to decide whether he would go to British Columbia or Australia. Shows you how much he knew about the th business of theater. British Columbia worked, uh, or won, or lost. And he boarded a ship and found himself in, in British Columbia, thinking he had a job with a farmer. The farmer had never heard of him, but he gave him a job, let him sleep in the barn, and, and uh, my father worked... For the next 10 years, uh, alternating between working on a farm, digging ditches, driving a truck, working for the British Electric Company, the British Railroad Company, um, doing anything to sustain himself between jobs as an actor. He ultimately worked for um, three repertory theater groups in British Columbia. Uh, he auditioned uh, for uh, the Gene Russell players, and um, uh, in an, uh, he told the uh, director of that company that he was an experienced British actor, when in fact he'd only seen the plays that he told. <laughs> and he told the story on himself that his his salary was thirty dollars a week when the performance went uh, when the curtain went up on his first performance. But it was $15 a week when the curtain came down on his first performance because it was abundantly clear he had never set foot on a stage before. At least he still had a job. So over a 10-year period, uh, he learned his craft, uh, sometimes getting paid, sometimes not. But at least he was a quick study. They would do three to five plays a week, traveling all over British Columbia, um, eventually he made his way down to Chicago twice, scampered right back up to British Columbia because the plays closed immediately, and, and eventually made his way down to California um, after almost 10 years in British Columbia. And he was still um, with a play that ended up closing uh, and not even getting paid for it in the Los Angeles area. And then he um, um, again found work in a play and uh, had, hadn't given any thought at all to film work. And certainly it had no training in film work. But he um, sustained himself, sometimes 
making a can of soup last for two days. I mean, it, it was just starvation time again. And um, I eventually got a role in the criminal code um, with a, what is called a showy part. And it was directed by Howard Hawks. And um, when that was made into a film, he got the same part in the film. And that took him from the ranks of being an extra to, a, my father would say, the fourth from the left in the third row, and to a bit part player. Um, he, found, he was in I don't, countless silent films, normally ta uh, cast as a, some sort of an ethnic role, always as a sinister part because of his dark coloring and his ethnic looks. And um, eventually he got to, uh, he made some serials. Um, and um, eventually he began making films fairly on a regular basis, but still only as a, as a, a bit part player. He moved up from the roles of an extra. Um, and uh, he found himself in the commissary at Universal one day, and uh, they were they were looking for someone to play the monster um, in Frankenstein. Unfortunately, Lon Chaney Sr. had um, uh, been, would have been offered the part, but he had died pre very young from throat cancer. And Bela Lugosi had been offered the role, but had turned it down because it was a non-speaking role. And so James Whale spotted my father in the commissary and called him over to his table and said, Mr. Karloff, your face has interesting possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> my father was there in his very best suit and was just slightly taken aback when he, uh, James Whale asked if he would test for the part as the, of the monster. But my father had been a starving actor for years, and um, he would test for just about anything, certainly when asked by a prominent director like James Whale was at that time. It was my father's 81st film, and as he said, nobody saw the first 80. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jack Pierce, the makeup genius, and he worked for three weeks perfecting that makeup before they even did a test, a screen test on the makeup. And after that, it was cinema history. After 20 years, my father became an overnight star. <laughs> so I have brought with me um, some DVDs, first of which is um, some blessedly brief home movies, which go to prove the point that the home movies of movie stars are just as boring as everybody else's home movies. <laughs> but in them, um, um, they contain, uh, I think, the only known to exist color footage of my father in the Frankenstein makeup. Uh, they were taken on the set of a, a son of Frankenstein, and uh, they show the genius of Jack Pierce knowing enough to... Uh, tint the makeup just slightly in a, with a greenish color so that on black and white film it would show up a deathly gray. Um, Jack, uh, my father always said Jack was an absolute genius, the best in the business, and indeed he was. Um, and it all, these home movies also show my father's sense of humor. This is after my father's head was shaved for Tower of London. It's going back in. And he, my mother had left me with him one afternoon to play bridge. And my father thought it was amusing to have my head shaved. My mother did not find it so amusing. And later there'll be a shot with me with my shaved head. At one time my folks had 22 dogs in Beverly Hills. We had Scotties and Westies, West Highland Terriers, and Bedlington Terriers, which are, look like a lamb. They brought the first Bedlington Terrier over from England in the 30s. 
and in a shot coming up, there'll be a Bennington in it briefly. There, it looks like I'm wearing a Bedlington. <laughs> For the, those of you who know who the character actor Jimmy Gleason was, he was a wonderful character actor. That's his grandson. Recalcitrant. This is a family friend. My father usually drove a convertible, and I don't know. The flowers, again, are bigger than the child. I have no idea where we're going. This is in New York. I became a streetwalker at a very early age. <laughs> My father was in arsenic and old lace at the time. And here we go. That's why all the toys now are green. Just can't help himself. That's Jack Pierce. He and my father spent more hours together over in the makeup chair in Jack's lab. They had a wonderful relationship. I think Jack did the makeup on about 12 films with my father. Drove him to drink, actually. But the, it, um, those makeups took hours and hours. Not the best shot of my father. The best. They, um, they spent untold hours together. My father loved the out of doors. I used to say he was playing tennis at a forest lawn, but it actually was Forest Hills. This is when my head had been shaved. No wonder my mother wasn't thrilled. This is a boat we had in our pool in Beverly Hills. I think my mother was taking me out to drown me with my, <laughs> with my shaved head. And this is a Beverly Hills birthday party. Doesn't everyone have an elephant at a child's birthday party in Beverly Hills? This is my father's 50th birthday. This is slightly out of sync since I was born on his 51st birthday. Most expensive birthday present he ever got. But those are all cricket figures on the birthday cake. And um, don't ever give Boris Karloff a knife. This is from This Is Your Life. You have a birthday this coming Saturday. Isn't uh, there someone else whose birthday uh, falls on the same day as yours? I believe so, yes. Your daughter? Yes. Sarah Jane. Well, here she is from Sausalito, California, where she's attending a Munson Business School from San Francisco. Your daughter, by the Sarah Jane. The baby grew up. Oh, yes, uh, whenever possible. You've always spent your birthdays together. Oh, sit right down here by Daddy. Haven't you, Sarah Jane? Yes, but not this year because Dad and me will be on the way to New York. Sure. Well, that's why we want you to be here tonight, uh, Sarah Jane, so you and your dad could celebrate your birthdays right now. <laughs> Happy birthday. To, how about that? To Sarah Jane, your daddy. We have a little birthday gift for you. My father had, uh, Jack, um, Ralph Edwards and my father were really great friends, and my father had gotten him to promise he would never, ever do that to him. He later said my stepmother sold him out for a washer and dryer. <laughs> he was horrified that night. And now you've, you've made it through the whole movies.
actually, while they change DVDs, I have a quick question. Yes. I had heard, and you tell me if you can corroborate this, that when your mother was in labor, your father was in makeup, and that he raced to the hospital in his Frankenstein makeup. Is that true or false? That's urban legend. Urban legend. It was a good legend, though. No, they wouldn't have let him off the set. There are photographs <laughs> in that makeup. Um, there are photographs of my father, uh, the cast and crew, holding a birthday party on the set, and he's in makeup. There are also there also is a fairly well known photograph of my father at the hospital, um, and the nurse holding me as a baby, and my father's in a very respectable suit. Oh, okay. Well, it was a good urban legend. <laughs> In some of the films where he does play Frankenstein, it shows a humanity of the character. And I wonder if he developed a lot of that character, or was it Whale who was telling him what to do to be that character? Um, I think it was my father's interpretation. I think the film um, was a wonderful marriage of talents. It was the script. Uh, the basic underlying story. It was the script. It was um, Jack Pierce's magnificent creative makeup. Mm -hmm. It was James Whale's direction. And it was my father's interpretation of the role. I think it was this wonderful, wonderful collection and marriage of talents that, that made that, that particular film uh, what it was. He really um, gave a tremendous humanity to a monster. And what's interesting is in the Mary Shelley book of Frankenstein, Frankenstein was actually a handsome man, a handsome monster, as it were, a good-looking monster. So this, this is an interpretation just to be the look that, you know, was created. But being in that kind of makeup for so long while they're shooting, I'm sure had to be uncomfortable. Oh, it, it took four hours to put it on, but it took three hours to take it off every night. Yes. And what you have to consider is the camera doesn't lie. And so that makeup had to be exactly the same every single day. And so my father had to um, uh, report to Jack's uh, makeup lab at 4 a.m. every morning wow. to start shooting at 8 a.m. And then whenever they would finish shooting at the end of the day, he would have three additional hours. Now, they weren't paid overtime. Mm -hmm. They were paid a flat amount. My father was just a piece of meat. My father wasn't even invited to the premiere of the film because... One, nobody knew that this film was going to be the huge success that it was, but they also anticipated that the star of the film was going to be Colin Clive, not the monster. And so um, my father was nothing but uh, a bit part player that was just going to stumble around as the monster, and it was his <laughs> interpretation of it that, brought the pathos and the um, empathy mm -hmm. uh, and the hum human element to it. He said that kids got it. They understood that the monster was the victim and not the perpetrator, and that it was the adults that were frightened of the monster. And little Maria uh, in the film uh, always asked to ride with my father to shoots. My father was one of the founding <coughs> members of the Screen Actors Guild. His card number was number nine. Mm, that's... And um, his work with the Guild and the formation of it was so important to him because these 12 founding members had experienced such treatment like 19, 20-hour work mm -hmm. days. And then once they had gained a, um, a position of of being able to speak out on behalf of actors. Um, and and th they wanted to form a vehicle. It was a union, but form a vehicle by which uh, up-and-coming actors would have some vehicle, some voice 
uh, with which to speak out and and have some control over the manner in which they were treated, the hours uh, they would work, uh, and uh, these founding members were putting their their careers on the line. Uh, they ran the risk of being blackballed and never working again. But it was very important what these uh, 12 actors did forming SAG, Screen Actors Guild. And um, SAG today is, is um, as important as it was then, I think. But it certainly was important then because the all-powerful studios and directors could treat these actors just abysmally and did. And um, that's why that work was so important to my father because of the way he was treated. When The Mummy was done, um, that makeup took almost as long to put on. Um, the, the role of Imhotep, where he is wrapped as a mummy, uh, that makeup took so long to put on, wrapping it, dampening it, drying it, wrapping and layer after layer. And at the end of when they finished wrapping it, he pointed out to them that they'd forgotten to put in a fly. <laughs> so they had to do a little adjusting, and did. But then um, they went ahead and shot a 19-hour day. And at the end of the day, my father collapsed on the set because the gauze had absorbed all of his body fluids. And he was totally dehydrated, and they had to call the, the what was then the medics in, and uh, he nearly died. So it was that sort of. Even though by that time he was known as Karloff the Uncanny, and had star status, they still overworked, underpaid, and mistreated the actors, partially out of ignorance and partially out of the fact there were a lot of starving actors around that would take their spot. You wouldn't say it had to do with money and greed? I just... A whole lot of things. A lot of it, right. Yeah, the studios yeah. weren't exactly generous. They aren't today either. Um, did he have a favorite dramatic role, do you think? I think he had a favorite film at different times of his career for different reasons. Frankenstein, for the obvious reason of the pivotal difference it made um, in his life, both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. uh, the Val Luton films, uh, The Body Snatcher, which is magnificent, Bedlam and Isle of the Dead. Um, those were really good films. They were uh, well scripted, well shot, brilliantly directed. Um, and he really enjoyed working with Val. Uh, uh, I know he enjoyed making um, the, the comedy of terrors and the and um, um, the Raven, the remake of the Raven, uh, with um, uh, Vincent Price and Peter Lorre and Basil Rathbone, because those old men had had knew each other, had worked together had great respect for one another, and they could, they enjoyed the opportunity to spoof their own boogeyman images mm -hmm. and play practical jokes on one another um, on the set, drive Roger Cra uh, Corman crazy, which they really enjoyed doing. <laughs> and and um, so that they enjoyed, he, he enjoyed those films. Um, and he, uh, as I say, especially The Body Snatcher, he enjoyed. And then uh, later on, of course, uh, Targets with Peter Bogdanovich. He, he uh, admired Peter. He enjoyed making that film. It was a good film. And it, um, he did that um, long um, speech in it, which he did in one take. And the cast and crew got, stood up and applauded. And that brought, really made him cry. Made him uh, cry. Yeah. What was it like to be the daughter of a monster? I mean, people had, no, no, people, had, when you're a child and people, or a teenager and people had seen the movie, did it affect you at all? Had a lot of perks. And I was teased. 
That's what I wondered. Yeah. But um, in Hollywood, when I was young, um, a celebrity name wasn't a big deal. And then when I um, moved to San Francisco and um, went to a private girls' school, not that it shows, um, it stood out like a sore thumb. And I was teased, but what it did is it taught me to cast my own shadow. Uh, so again, it was a valuable lesson. Um, I was always very proud of my father, so um, it, it it was nothing but a positive influence because he was he was one of the very few people in Hollywood about whom nothing negative was ever written or said, and so um, he was just a, a lovely human being, and there's just nothing negative to be said about that or taken away from that. How has it been in your experience carrying on your father's legacy, like being able to shepherd, you know, uh, these stories and, you know, his films onto new generations? The fans do that. The fans do that. The fans are wonderful. The fans are who have um, given my father's legacy its long legs. They are absolutely wonderful. Um, I don't have to... Because of my father's own reputation um, and his own character, um, I don't have. I can do blind interviews. I don't have to worry about any of the questions I'm going to be asked, and I don't have to worry about uh, fans coming up at shows and asking me questions. The fans are just lovely. If you would like more information about the films and filmmaker series, please go to Montclair State University's website and search for the filmmaker series. For more information about Carpe Diem, you can write to us on the email address on your screen, carpe diem at mail.montclair.edu, or call us at 973-655-5158. For Carpe Diem, I'm Marjorie Chacon. Thanks for watching.